Good morning, church. Great to be home after a short two-week ministry trip to Athens and Colombo. Uh, I sent an email out this week to uh, fit in a little bit. It was a uh, successful trip, though I was crook for three days in Athens in bed with a terrible head cold. Um, so I missed two engagements, ministering at a Bible college and also to a whole pile of staff with uh, Jonathan Macris of Hellenic Ministries. But um, but did the conference, and I think the ties uh, are growing in relation to working with Greek evangelical and Pentecostal leaders to see churches planted in Greece. And I'm looking forward to next year when Jonathan Macris, the head of Hellenic Ministries, comes and ministers here and all three of our congregational services in next March. But uh, Greece is very needy. Uh, 12 million people, half of them live in the greater Athens area, nearly 6 million people. Uh, it's just a, yeah, a lot of people there. And um, very few churches. Uh, altogether, there would be maybe between 25,000 and 30,000 evangelical Pentecostal Christians. And traditionally, they haven't worked together. They've been very divided and competitive. And so this conference called Refresh is, is getting them together. And there was a South African pastor and an Amer a Canadian pastor and myself that ministered. Um, so uh, we, we think that we'll be able to, to build the connections and to see, particularly those of you that are fellow Greek Australians and others within our denominational family, CRC churches, I'm hoping that we can get a fresh vision to help uh, the country of our parents' birth with the gospel and to realise that, that so much of the book of Acts was actually reaching Greece. Uh, Paul preaching on Mars Hill and leading the Athenians and Philippians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, um, and to see the country so barren spiritually. Uh, they've got religion, but not a relationship with Jesus. So uh, pray for Greece. Uh, and I went to Colombo. We had Pastor Somanathan here um, and we're supporting the Colombo project, and it was just great to minister there. Um, the, uh, uh, Kathy ministered uh, there as well, and uh, she, she got top billing. I, I came in second. <laughs> I'm resentful of this. And um, so she shared with um, uh, the men and women at the conference, we had about 50 pastors, leaders, about uh, being healed from traumatic childhood or childhood trauma uh, because uh, Sri Lanka had a terrible, terrible civil war. A lot of evil came on that country, murderous evil. And every family, uh, particularly Tamil families, uh, who are either Hindu or, or Christian, uh, lost, um, they would have lost a member of their family. So they, they estimate over 200,000 people were murdered and whole villages were raped. You know, just they would, the military would just go in and just sort of using rape as a tool of power to subjugate people um, and Pastor Somanathan's own brother was, was murdered and never found the body, they just took him one night, killed him. Uh, Somanathan, our pastor, I didn't realise, I knew he had one close call but he had three close calls where he nearly was murdered and uh, he was on a train uh, heading uh, back to Colombo and for some reason it was a Tamil tiger, this is the revolutionary group and um, the guy, the young kid, he must have been 16, 17, he was treating somebody really badly and uh, on the train. And these are the Tamil Tigers who were fighting the government. And so, uh, and so Som spoke up and said, look, you shouldn't talk to, to your elders like this, you know? And uh, he goes, you're gonna alienate people. You know, this kid pulls out his gun and, um, and basically puts it to his head. And, uh, um, and then the others, and he was, uh, came by and so they, they stopped the train they were going to take him off and shoot him and just throw him in, in the jungle. That's what they would do. But they had to do it privately so they couldn't see him. And so, uh, so the people were praying, the, the Psalms uh, team and the other pastor, Pastor Rajas, was there. He was praying, scared like anything. And, and then there was a, uh, a captain came up and uh, found out what's going on, etc. And uh, found out and he, and he whispered into, he's a Sinhalese person. The Sinhalese are mostly Buddhist, some Christian. And he whispered, he goes, I'm a Christian too. He goes, and so uh, he spoke to the others and told them just to get back and uh, let someone Arthur live. But he would have been killed. It happened three times. Uh, that was with the Tamil Tigers, once with the military. And so he is just, when he shares the stories, you realise God has saved this man 
to uh, lead a revival and we're, we're supporting their major building venture. We're putting in 10,000 bucks a year uh, from 2010, 2020 that we've put up this amazing building along with our fellow CRC churches. So being there was pretty powerful. Kath ministered very well. Then she had the women, uh, married women, uh, secret women's business. No men were allowed. And then uh, the, the single women uh, got together as well. So, uh, so she was a hit. And so next time we go, she'll probably do half of what I do. So oh, that's great. I'll stay at the hotel and she can minister. <laughs> so uh, it was good. Um, you would have got my email about, uh, uh, we put up another 120 solar panels up top. You want to have a look at them? Have a look at that. And Milan reckons we've still got room on the roof for more. So we've got 240 panels up there. Government gave us another 10,000 bucks to help purchase them. The first lot, 120 that we put up there several years ago, um, the, our electricity bill was hitting 50,000 a year. It's gone down to below 25,000 a year. And then this new bunch, we reckon you can't quite reduce it to no because I don't know, if we produce more electricity and put it in there, it doesn't quite work, government regulations and so, uh, but anyway, it'd be great to be neutral, wouldn't it? The day will come where we will have batteries and we'll be able to store it and then be, wouldn't that be great to be electricity neutral? Fantastic. So Milan, thank you as General Manager for the work you've done in putting that together. So that's just good, good stewardship and uh, environmentally sound and economically wise, hey? Hey, we've been doing a series uh, entitled Foundations for Life, Timeless Reformation Truths, and a big thank you to Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther would have to be, without a doubt, the most influential person of the last 500 years. For some of you, you're saying, I don't know anything about him. Check him out on YouTube. There's some great docos on him and films and uh, I'm not exaggerating on his influence upon the lives of the entire world. In fact, all evangelicals, all Pentecostals are also Lutherans. And so he has infected the entire world. And my first message I, I shared about he revolutionised family life by his own example. Marriage, raising kids. And uh, the other thing he did was he introduced music to church that people could sing. Nobody would sing at church up to then. It was organised choirs, so he decided to get the people singing. And so in his own home, you see him with his, with his kind of guitar and with his kids, and so he was uh, introduced music. So the whole notion of congregational singing was a Luther idea that now is, of course, even within the Catholic Church, there is congregational singing. And that was revolutionary back then. So uh, he is a pretty influential guy. Um, but in his early life, I, I would think he was quite neurotic and unstable. Um, in fact, they're trying to do a psychiatric assessment on him. And there is one school of thought that he was quite insane, that he was a crazy man. Um, that's pretty weird. Um, but at the same time, there were some tendencies in his childhood and his teenage years and his early, in his 20s, where you could say he was quite neurotic and quite unstable and who knows where he would have ended up if he didn't come to Christ and get saved. And um, his, his views of God the Father were really wacky. And, um, he, um, and they say that's traced back to the harsh treatment his own natural father, uh, dis, dis, his discipline of, of Luther. And Luther would say that he would be disciplined to the point where there would be bloodshed. I mean, they were really tough in those days. Kids were, were seen and, and not heard, and when they disciplined, they were really disciplined. Um, yet he loved his dad, and his dad seemed to be a good man, but it just tended to be the tendency back then that kids were really beaten uh, pretty badly. And uh, so Luther, he, he, his view of the father, heavenly father, was really affected by his upbringing, and he, he only saw God the father as being ha a harsh judge, always with a stick in his hand. Um, and so uh, as a little boy and as a teenager and in his early 20s, um, there were some behaviours like his, his, his seeking perfect righteousness. He's driven to, to want to, to somehow please God to such a degree that he's just seeking perfect righteousness 
And Luther finally breaks through where he sees it, that it's a gift and he has to receive the gift of righteousness or a gift of a right standing with God. He, he, he's striving and he's working so hard to try and, and earn God's merits and it's a costly work. And he finally comes to a place of understanding salvation by the free grace of God. He has this cringing fear of God and then that gets transformed into a confident faith in God. Um, he's confused about God. In fact, he has a love-hatred relationship with God. And he records all this down. He goes, there were times when I just hated God and I hated Christ. And he's, a, he's an Augustinian monk now. So he's actually an Augustinian monk because you think this is the way of salvation. So he would go to confessional every day and most people go to confessional in the Catholic system back then for maybe, you know, three or four minutes and confess, you know. How do you sin being stuck in a monastery? It's not much to do. So he goes in there every time for three hours confessing. At the end, the confessor, who was a father figure, says, leave me alone, stop hassling me. If you come back, come back with a real sin to confess, will you? And he's just kind of neurotic. And, and so he, even in his penance, when he's confessing, he comes back and and, and it comes back, I've got to see you again. Why? He goes, well, because I did confess that sin. Uh, and, um, and then when I came out, I had a bit of pride thinking, well, now I'm okay. I've got to confess that too. So he drove this, the, the guy who was in charge of the church, uh, of the monastery, crazy. <laughs> so I think that's a little bit unbalanced, don't you think? A little bit neurotic. And so he, he would actually say, when I used to see a crucifix, I, I didn't want to see it. He goes, and I'd see, I'd see a picture of Christ, and all he'd see was judgment. And so he said, at, at the end, I hated Christ. And he's a monk, seeking after perfection. No, he's really in a bad way. <laughs> and, uh, and so we think out of this neurotic, unstable, confused state of mind, as he's really wanting God in his life, but he can't find him because the systems in place were all based on seeking perfection and striving and uh, there was terrible fear that th th he was either going to end up uh, doing something dastardly to himself or he's going to find Christ and so he did he ended up he ended up uh, becoming a Christian a real born-again Christian and uh, his his testimony of his conversion is one of those beautiful stories when you read it he says, I felt like I was born again and like the, the gates of paradise were open and I could see the Father smiling at me, welcoming me and being happy with me as his guilt and fear and shame is removed as he's been declared righteous, not because of what he can do, but because of who Christ is and what Christ has done for him. So he was just uh, an amazing history of conversion as an Augustinian monk and, uh, and the great reason why we celebrate his life is, is October the 31st, 1517, he nailed 95 statements on the church door of the castle of Wittenberg, where he was the, the Bible scholar in, in the university. And that was transformative. And if you want to check out some of the YouTube docos on him, you'll see how transformative that was. But these are the statements that all of us agree to, that a pure Luther and every evangelical, every Pentecostal says this, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because we had hold to scripture alone as being the ultimate authority. And scripture reveals that our sufficiency is in Christ alone. And so the Ephesians 2 passage, I, I, I saw um, Bishop Tim Harris's message on grace. Wasn't that fantastic? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ephesians 2 says, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, we are saved by grace through faith for good works. Luther reversed that. He is saved by works, okay, to endeavour to find faith to receive grace. And so when the revelation hit him, that it's salvation by grace. God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E. God's free unmerited favour, it's a gift. Received like a child receives a gift by faith. And then out of that, good works flow. And so Luther was reversing that. And see, a religion 
endeavors to do that. Religion is man trying to appease God, trying to please God, trying to find God. And the Luther story, maybe it's a bit extreme, but really that is the case of, of hundreds of millions of people across our world that are striving for ultimate reality and meaning and purpose. And their, and their religion is a do-it-yourself proposition trying to find. Whereas Christianity is a revealed faith that God revealed himself, Jesus came from heaven to provide the way by which we can get to heaven by his life and his death and his resurrection on our behalf. And so Luther discovered the Christ of the scriptures for himself and how we also need to discover the Christ of the scriptures. But which Christ? The Bibles or our own Christ? So today, too many people have a Christ of their own imagining and not the real Christ of the New Testament. And uh, even people who hang around churches at times think they're worshipping Jesus, but I think, is it the Jesus of the four Gospels? I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's a Jesus that's a, a, a Jesus of their own making. Um, and it's the Bible's Christ that, that we, we, we seek. Look at the scripture in Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, the Old Testament, at many times and in various ways. In other words, it was a, there was a gradual progressive revelation of God's nature in the Old Testament. So to understand who God is, the God and Father uh, of the Scriptures, you can't start with the Old Testament. You've got to start with the New Testament. As I say to people, start with the Gospel, and I prefer the Gospel of Luke, uh, mainly because he was Greek and you've got to read his first. And, uh, but others say start with John um, or Matthew or Mark and, and because that's where we discover Jesus because it says in verse 2 but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe so the final completed revelation of what God is like can only be discovered through Jesus when God visited the planet and God became a man, God the Son became a man. And so uh, when you read the four Gospels, I tell you, um, it is a Gospel that reveals a Christ who at times can be incredibly inconvenient and controversial. And to get too many people today want a Jesus meek and mild who is convenient and non-controversial. Don't upset my lifestyle. And uh, I just want a nice, happy life. <laughs> and Jesus did not come to give us that, actually. He came to reveal what God is like, to give us a fulfilling life, a life of meaning and purpose. But at times it can be difficult because his demands are pretty tough. At times he's inconvenient and controversial and radical. Uh, I've known him for 46 years. And uh, at times when he speaks and directs and, and, uh, and, and I have to conform to his will if I'm straying, because at times he, he can be very firm, but I tell you what, he is totally good. He has never done me ill. And the things he asks me to give up or to yield are things that are just poison anyway. I don't realise it, but I'm drinking poison. And he says, I'll remove the poison from you. Some things... I've got to change, Bill. Some attitudes have got to shift. Some behaviours have got to be modified. Why? Because you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt others. So he never leads us into evil. He only leads us into good because that's his nature. But he's challenging. <laughs> and uh, so we have a Christ who we serve, not a Christ who serves us. And so in, in this day and age, we need to understand it is Luther found the Christ of the scriptures. So what was Christ's mission? Well, two parts to his mission was to reveal our heavenly father to us. So we can now know what God is like as we look at Jesus, as we reflect upon his words and as we examine his actions. So the sun, again, verse three of Hebrews that I've just read, says the sun is the radiance of God's glory. Isn't that great? I love that the exact representation of his being. You want to know what God is like? Look into the eyes of Jesus. Read what he said. Examine his words. Watch how he acted and reacted. And that's what Luther did. And all the false views of God the Father were neutralized in him. He discovered what God was like as he looked at Jesus. 
And I love John 1, 4. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the most devastating truth teller. He is perfect in His truth telling and in His sense of justice. He's also the most generous grace giver, perfect in love and mercy. And so when Luther discovered the Christ of the Scriptures, because before he only had portions of Scripture that were allowed to be read during the ceremonies of what was then the Catholic system. And so the, pulp, the, the Bibles were chained to the pulpits. And they were always in Latin, not even in Greek. So he being a scholar, he learnt Greek and he learnt Latin. And then he found a, new, a Greek New Testament from Erasmus, a, a top thinker from, from uh, Holland. And Erasmus translated the Latin Vulgate, which was the, supposedly the original, that Jerome translated around 400 or so AD, and he translated it back into the original Greek. And so he now is a, is a scholar of the Greek, and he realises, hey, what? some of the words Jerome translated were wrong. So he's, he's learning, and he actually now is reading the scripture for himself, and he's awakened to who Christ really is. And, and so he, he just is, is amazingly transformed by the revelation of who this Jesus is. And, and he gets saved. And so he reveals the Heavenly Father to us. And, and one of the, the great proofs for me of the, the deity of Christ, that there's no other way to explain him, is how come every society, every culture, every race, both male and female, young and old, when they examine Jesus, he is everything they want to be? What is that? So a 90-year-old woman and a 9-year-old girl will read about Jesus and say, I want to be like that. But he's a 33-year-old Palestinian Jew. You don't want to be like a man. Because he's more than a man. See, God made the male and female in the beginning. Okay? And so perfect masculine traits and perfect feminine traits were in Jesus. So he was more than a man. He's not a woman. He revealed himself in the person of, of, of a man, Jesus of Nazareth. But he's more than a man. What is it? There's no other person in human history, there's no other religious leader, there's no other philosophical leader that a woman will say, that's who I want to be like. No, no, no. There's no confusion regarding genders here. It is just he is perfection. And so we see in Christ that he transcends culture and race and age and, and, and the sexes. Amazing. So to reveal our Heavenly Father to us, that's Christ's mission, and to become our only possible saviour. Now this is... So politically incorrect what I'm going to say now in our present culture. In this age that worships tolerance and, and has, a, has a false sense of inclusiveness, this is, <laughs> these are the words of Jesus. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I, Tom, am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He is saying, I am God. I'm unique. He is saying there's only one way by which you can experience salvation and can come to know God as your heavenly father. It's exclusive. He's the only one who can get us to heaven. And, uh, and these words are the truth. Um, and yet we say to our world, we don't say we are unique or we are exclusive we don't say we are better. We just say, you know what? We're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find some water and where to find some bread. He is the water of life. He is the, the bread of life. So we just say our Jesus is so much better. No other religious leader compares to him. So we say he is unique. He is fully God and fully man. And there is no other way by which you can get to heaven and be saved outside of faith in him. Now, in some countries in the world, you can be killed for this. You can be murdered for this. And some people are murdered. I read the story of Costas Macris. This is Jonathan's father. I read the book on the plane. Life story. He's like a Barry Silverback. He went to Irian Jaya, first Greek missionary out of the country. 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, he went to Irian Jaya. One of the most heart-moving moments was when two of his missionary brothers were killed, murdered. Like what happened to John Elliot to, uh, 
in, in, with the Orca Indians in South America. This is 1960s. One was a man from Melbourne, one was an American. They got speared to death. And it just devastated them all. They were killed for their faith because these people in, in Irianjaya were headhunters and they had such superstitious beliefs that it challenged the power base of the witch doctors and, and uh, who were trying to control the people. And then out of that, uh, that whole village got saved and, and very, very moving. You realise, wow. But you know, um, today we don't face physical persecution, but already those who adhere to this face a psychological persecution here in Australia. They face an emotional persecution because you say, well, there are many ways to God. You know, how, aren't you being exclusive? Aren't you being unloving by, by saying that, that, you know, surely there's, you know, through Hinduism and Buddhism and, and any other ism, that they're all ways by which you can experience salvation. We say, no, no, there's only one way. And that is through Jesus Christ. And you hold that position, church, we will be persecuted for holding that position. But we must not be persecuted for holding a position that's unloving and ungrateful and somehow superior mentality to other people. We say, no, 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 we're just showing you the way. We're not better. We're just showing you that Jesus is the only way. Um, look at 2 Timothy. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures. This is Paul to Timothy from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ. So it's through the scriptures alone that we can discover the salvation that comes through Christ alone. And this was what happened to Luther. And this is the, the, his story is the story that has been repeated hundreds of millions of times. We all need to discover that Christ is our only possible saviour. And that he has come to reveal the Father. So what is Jesus doing right now in heaven? People, miss, people have a crazy kind of view of Jesus. Like he's just waiting to come back. So he's just kind of twiddling his thumbs. Just, you know, when can I come back? When can I come back and wrap things up? No, he's actually ministering in heaven. And he's busier now than when he was walking this earth. Because when he's walking this earth, he ministered to say, let's say 50,000 different people in that three and a half years. Maybe it was more, maybe less, I'm not too sure. Now he's ministering to hundreds of millions of people right across the world. And so he is much busier in, in heaven and, and Luther's revelation of Christ was one where not only did he understand that he was the one who revealed the Father and the only way by which he could be saved as a free gift of salvation, he saw the risen Christ as his best buddy. And he became closer than, than his dearest friend. So what is Christ's present ministry? Firstly, he's our mediator. He mediates for you. There is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. He gave his life to purchase your freedom. We are free through our new identity in Christ from slavery to sonship, from sinner to saint. It's all because of Christ. There's no other way by which we can experience this. He is our mediator. Look at Hebrews 9. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free. So we have been given such promises about our rich inheritance now that we're in Christ. The scripture says we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ, Ephesians 1.3. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says that all the promises of God are now yes in Christ. Not maybe, if, that you can actually talk to the Father and receive the inheritance that is yours, the blessings that are yours now and for eternity. So he's our mediator. Secondly, he advocates for us. He's our advocate. My dear children, this is John speaking, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, a defense attorney, someone who speaks on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Church, it's not impossible for a Christian to sin. But it is possible for a Christian not to sin. Is that too deep this morning? It's not impossible for a Christian to sin. But it is possible for a Christian not to sin. 
And so the normal Christian life is we learn to live above the impulses that dominated us when we were outside of Christ. And so we can learn to live above, but there are times when we can actually fall and fail. And, uh, you know, we believe in Christian perfection, not sinless perfection. A Christian perfection is that I'm getting better. You should be getting better and, and more Christ-like as you're getting older. But we don't believe in sinless perfection where our sin nature dies. So some people believe this, that our sin, the sin principle in us dies when we become a Christian. Well, that's just ridiculous. Because it means that my children, my four children that are born, will be born in grace. They'd come out of the womb worshipping Jesus. Thank you, Lord, I've experienced salvation. No, they haven't. And when they start growing up, you see the sin principle working in them. And even though we have been endeavoured to be good parents, you discover that they are little sinners. <laughs> and they can lie, and they can steal, and they can cheat, and they can deceive with the best of them. Childish ones, but you know, they've got to come to a place. God's got no grandchildren. They've got to get, they've got to realise, they can only... God's only got kids. They've got to be born into his kingdom. They've got to come to a place of repenting of their sin, saying, I'm a sinner, <laughs> I'm lost, I need Jesus as my saviour. So that knocks on the head the theory that the moment you become a Christian, the sin principle dies in you. No, 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 no. You die to the sin principle. The engagement's off. I'm no longer engaged to the sin principle. I'm now engaged to Jesus, and I have the means through Jesus and the Holy Spirit to be able to live above the sin impulse if I stay humble and dependent on Jesus, that's essential. But if I let pride or mistrust or get my eyes off Jesus and onto other things, I can stumble. And so uh, that's why it's not impossible for a Christian to sin, but it is possible for a Christian not to sin. And so he is the source of your new life and he is the sustainer of your new life in him. So if you have sinned this week and you know you have sinned, what do you do with that sin? You've got a defense attorney in heaven. You've got an advocate who says, you know what? My death on the cross covered your past sins, covers your present sins, and will cover your future sins. The penalty of sin's been dealt with, past tense, through the death of Jesus on the cross. The power of sin can be dealt with through the resurrection power of Jesus by him sending the Holy Spirit to come and live within us that we can rise above it. And the presence of sin will be delivered from that when he comes again. Past, present, future. So he is the atoning sacrifice, it says, for our sins. And not only for ours, but for those of the whole world. So if you sin, your relationship with Jesus, with the Father, is secure. You're married to him. You're born again. You can't be unborn. You can't be unborn. You can, you can say, well, I'll change my name from Vasilakis to Tompich or to Bryce. But that doesn't change anything. I'm still a Vasilakis. I'm born of my father Stamatis and my mother Maria. You can't change that. If you're born of God, you're born of God. You, you can't get unborn. If you're adopted, you can't be unadopted. You belong to him. So the relationship is secure. God doesn't go, oh man, judgment's coming your way because you've sinned. What? There's no condemnation for those in Christ. If you're humble and say, God, I've messed up. I made a boo-boo. I didn't treat my wife as I should. And all the men here go, yeah, me too. All the women, oh, I didn't treat my husband. Or I said the wrong thing to that child. Oh, the neighbour got on my nerves and I shouldn't have. Ah, You know, you're violating the law of love. You're not loving your neighbour as yourself and your neighbour is the person closest to you. Does God say, well, I'm going to wipe you out now. Judgment's coming. No, 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 no. He says, hey, come on. I'm with you. I'm your advocate. Just come to me. Humble yourself. Place your trust in me. All your sins are covered. Just don't hide your sins. Don't pretend to live the perfect life. Don't be a Luther. You know, like just, just admit where you're wrong and face up to it. You lack and you will receive the, the, the blessing. So your fellowship with God may, may get a little bit shaky at times. You know, like, oh man. Like, but your relationship with him is secure. So you've got to build relationship, build fellowship links with the Lord, prayer, word, church attendance, involvement, all those things that help us. But he's our advocate. 
I'll write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does, you've got an advocate with the Father. He doesn't say, God's going to reject you. He's our mediator. He's our advocate. He intercedes for us. I love this, Romans 8. This is fantastic. I wish I could read the whole chapter. But what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? No, the devil's against us, but he's been defeated. You might be against yourself too in, in wrong thinking patterns. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? You've been chosen by him. It's a sin for you to downgrade what God has done. To be harsh on yourself. To be whipping yourself. Self-flagellation. You're not good enough. No, 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 no. Jesus is good enough for you. And he has credited to you righteousness, a right standing. Our own righteousness are as filthy rags. He has given us a new robe of righteousness that he has given through his life and death and resurrection. And he says, now you have a right standing with me, with my father because of me. It is God who justifies. He's the one that gives you a right standing. That's what justification means, a right standing with God. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. The devil can't touch you on this one. And you shouldn't be condemning yourself either. Jesus Christ died. More than that, he's raised to life. And you know what he's doing? He's praying for you. He's interceding for you that you'll see it. He prays for you even when you don't pray to him. There might be a week that goes by and you haven't talked to him. Well, I guarantee he's been talking to the Father about you. And he's been thinking of you and he's been praying for you even when he is faithful, even when we are faithless. He is always watching out for you. Always. And he is constantly in your corner helping you even when you don't sense he is there. How many times do we, we don't even sense he's there but he's in your corner? I'm with you. I'm praying for you. I'm on your side. I know you've got enemies, but I'm on your side. I don't condemn you. I don't put you down. I love you. You're, 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 you're my brother. He's our elder brother. We're, 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 we're sons. He calls us out. He calls us friend. And finally, he is a merciful high priest. He's your high priest. You've got a personal high priest in heaven. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firm to the faith we profess. Hang on. <laughs> hang on. You profess it. Just hang on. For he, we don't have somebody who, who is unable to sympathize or empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Jesus empathizes with your weaknesses. He really understands because he's your closest friend. He knows exactly what you're like. He knows exactly what you're like. He sees you the entirety. He sees your weaknesses. He sees your struggles in your humanity, in your manhood, in your womanhood, in your parenting, in your marriages, in, at work. He sees it all. You can't hide a thing from him. So it's crazy to hide. It's crazy to run away. It's crazy to deceive yourself to think he doesn't know. He knows and he still loves you. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. He is love. And he has great empathy because he walked among us. He knows what it's like to be a human being. And in every area he was tested. Every area. He was, oh, there's some areas. I can't think of an area where he wasn't tested. People said to me, oh, yeah, but, you know, he didn't experience sexual abuse. How do you know? How do you know? You do a little bit of study on torturers, people that have total power over a prisoner who's condemned, and what they do to those men and women before they die. Hard to believe that those wretched Roman executioners did not abuse him in some way. I can't prove it. I just know what executioners are like that are brutal men who will beat you and, and, and do all, you've got no control. They've got total power. I've got a hunch that he was sexually abused by those wicked men. They did everything else to him. I think 
Jesus was tempted and was tried in every area like we were. He never sinned. Even with those terrible people, he forgave them. Didn't agree with what they did to him. It was wretched what they did to him. It was evil. But he didn't hold on to resentment. He forgave them and he forgave us. We have a merciful high priest. He empathizes with you and your weaknesses. He knows your weaknesses. He really understands because he's your closest friend. And then it says this. Let us then approach God's throne of judgment, of condemnation, of harshness, of vindictiveness. The God with the great big stick. Is that what it says? Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Wow. He encourages us to approach God's throne with great confidence. It's a throne of grace. It's not a throne of condemnation. It's not a throne of accusation. It's not a throne of judgment. How people can see God the Father as a harsh judge. His judgment was poured out on Mount Calvary at that time when he turned his back on his son who took the sin of the world. He became a curse for us so the curse could be lifted from us that we could be free from our sins. And judgment came on his son, not upon us. And whoever believes on him would not be condemned but have eternal life and live forever. What a God that we serve. Wow. Yeah, I think that does deserve a clap. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Hey, the promises, the promises of Jesus. Have a look at this. He says, he promises that you will receive mercy today when I close in prayer and find grace to help you in your time of need. If you're facing a need right now, if you need mercy, you need grace, you might say, Bill, I've mucked up. So? We all have. This is the best place to be. Come to the Father through Jesus and turn away from your sin. Run away from it and cling to him. Ask him for forgiveness. You need grace. You need mercy. He says, if you're in need, do it. Jesus is your mediator, your advocate, your intercessor, your high priest. Luther discovered this. And it was riveted into his life. Let's stand together.